welcome to Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen, here with another story about historically significant people, places, and events from Connecticut's long and fabled past. Today on Amazing Tales, we're completing our two-part series on the Rochambeau Trail, the 680-mile trail upon which General Rochambeau marched his 5,000 French troops in 1781 come to the aid of George Washington's Patriot Army, and together they fought the last major battle of the Revolutionary War in Yorktown, Virginia, bringing freedom from Great Britain to the young United States. My guests are Johnny Carawan, the trail administrator for the National Park Service for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historical Trail, Sal Lilienthal, a Kent, Connecticut resident, who actually biked and kayaked the entire length of the trail to help promote it. And returning for part one, Dr. Bob Selig, the foremost expert on the Rochambeau March and the Revolutionary War. And now, part two of A Trail Like No Other, It Brought Us Freedom. To quickly recap the highlights that we heard in part one of this two-part series, the Rochambeau Trail is 680 miles long, stretching from Newport, Rhode Island to Yorktown, Virginia. It's named after French military commander Rochambeau. He and his 5,000 French troops landed in Newport to help George Washington's Patriot Army fight the British in the Revolutionary War. They had come because, after five years of fighting, The Patriots weren't doing well against the British. They needed help, and they asked the French to provide it. The French were happy to help because they would then have a long-term ally in the seemingly never-ending wars that France always was fighting with England. If the French didn't help and the Patriots lost the war, the British would control all of North America, and the long-term prospects for France would be quite bleak. When we left off, Rochambeau and Washington had met in Hartford and agreed that their number one target was New York City. It was agreed to attack there in the summer of 1781. The French troops would march through Connecticut and head to Greenburg, New York in Westchester County, where they would join up with Washington's forces and final preparations would be made for the assault. Now, as a reminder, the Patriots had held New York City until late 1776. Then, shortly after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the British sent a huge swarm of soldiers to the city. Well, they drove George Washington and his army out of the city, forcing them to retreat back into New Jersey. If for no other reason, pure pride was reason enough to try to retake New York. But more importantly, the British had established their North American headquarters in New York City. If the British could be driven out of New York... The Patriots would certainly win the war once and for all. Well, the big year for this effort was 1781. It was then six years into the Revolutionary War, and a lot was riding on this joint campaign between the French and the Patriots. In March of 1781, the French forces were still in Rhode Island, where they had landed the year before. Washington visited Rochambeau in Newport to review the troops. Two months later, in May of 1781, The two generals met in Wethersfield, just south of Hartford. This was a major strategic meeting to finalize the plans. The mood was rather grim. As they took stock of their own forces and what they do with the British stronghold in New York, they realized they'd have to do more reconnaissance. Plus, the Patriots and French realized that they weren't as formidable as perhaps they needed to be. The French were simply a far better military outfit, according to Dr. Bob Selig. The average time of service is over five years. You know, the Continental Army isn't even five years old at the time. Not too many years before this time, the French had referred to the Continental Army as looking like ducks in cross belts. However, the Patriots had taken steps in the ensuing years to improve themselves. For instance, they no longer accepted young teens from farms throughout the colonies. In those six years of war, the Patriots had started to get smarter. Still, culturally, the two sides couldn't have been more different. The Continental Army had corporal punishment and floggings, not the French. And Continental Army soldiers often had to simply go without, something that Bob says the French actually came to admire. Uh, There's more than one officer that says uh, not getting paid, getting a little bit to eat only, and the way they are treated 
that's not something that would fly in the French army. But regardless of competence, there was now work to do and strategic plans to draw up. At that May meeting in Wethersfield, Washington and Rochambeau understood that the French Navy would be sailing into New York Harbor about two months later in mid-July, and this was going to be critical to success. The French Navy would complete what's known as the Siege Ring. Their blockade of New York Harbor would stop British ships from being able to resupply British forces in the city. This while Rochambeau and Washington's men attacked Manhattan and Brooklyn from the north. Since the British technically outnumbered the combined Patriot French forces, the support of the French Navy was instrumental to success. So with this knowledge, the final decision was made. They would attack New York City. Rochambeau marched his troops now across Connecticut, headed toward Greenberg, New York. In July, before the French Navy arrived, Washington, in a change of plans, decided to stage a surprise attack on an estate called Morrisania. The estate was located just north of the island of Manhattan, in what is today the Bronx. Washington wanted to send a message to the British. At the time, Rochambeau and Lausanne's French troops had finished marching across Connecticut and were on the Connecticut-New York border in Ridgefield. Washington sent a letter to Rochambeau, asking him to change plans and send his Lieutenant Lausanne's troops to Morrisania for the surprise attack instead of going to Greenberg. The letter just happened to arrive in Ridgefield on Rochambeau's birthday. Well, Bob says Lausanne was to meet up at Morrisania with Patriot forces commanded by a man who just happened to be named Lincoln. In the days before cell phones and other communications, the uh, Lincoln and Lausanne do not arrive at their destination at the same time. The mission essentially had to be called off with forces retreating to the north. They're going up basically Springbrook Parkway up toward Westchester County. Morrisania, by the way, is today part of the Harlem River Rail Yard, south of I-87 in the Bronx. Now there's nothing uh, left of it. At this point, the troops had established large campsites in Greenberg, New York. They'd be there for six weeks. It was their first chance to really get to know each other before the big attack on New York City. Washington and Rochambeau used this time to conduct several reconnaissance missions. They needed to know where the forts and troops were located and what types of defenses the British had in place. Well, while in Greenberg, Washington stayed at the Appleby House. It used to be in the Ardsley section of Greenberg, near where Ardsley High School is today. It is no longer standing. Rochambeau's headquarters were at the Odell House in the Hartsdale section of Greenberg. The Odell House is still standing. In fact, it's in the process of being restored. Washington was starting to worry. The French Navy hadn't arrived in New York Harbor as planned. He needed a backup plan. So he ordered his engineers to devise a strategy for taking New York without the Navy blockade. And that picture didn't look very pretty. On August 14, 1781, the entire universe changed. The Navy now was a month overdue. And the troops were waiting for combat. Well, it was on this fateful August 14th day that Washington was in his headquarters at Appleby House. He received a letter. It was from the commander of the French fleet. The fleet, it seems, wouldn't be coming to New York after all. Instead, they were going to be sailing further south to Chesapeake Bay. Navigating New York Harbor presented too many logistical difficulties for them. But they would be in place for an attack against the southern British forces under the command of General Cornwallis. Bob Zelig says that posed a huge challenge for Washington. Part of the problem is that on the 14th of August, he doesn't even know where Cornwallis is. It was thought at the time that Cornwallis would be moving his troops away from the coastline and further inland. And if that was true, the French fleet would be of no help to Washington and Rochambeau. Could he take New York City without the French fleet being in New York Harbor? The problem with this, as Washington had to admit to himself, is that he simply did not have the manpower to lay siege to New York City. He figured he needed at least 20,000 Continental Army forces and militia, and he barely had 10. The British had 13,000 troops in New York City. What if Washington called off the New York siege and marched south to take on Cornwallis? 
That would leave the 13,000 British troops in New York City free reign to sail up the Hudson River and cut off New England from the rest of the colonies. And if they left to fight in Virginia, who knows what might happen? And what if they lost the battle to Cornwallis? Certainly that would mark the end of the War of Independence and the colonies would belong to Great Britain forever. The stakes literally couldn't have been higher. What would be the outcome of a wrong call? Well, Bob says it would be different for Washington than it would be for the battle-hardened French, who, after all, already had their own country. Okay, you know, win some, lose some. If this goes wrong for the Continental Army, if this goes wrong for Washington, he may just find himself uh, being hung from the nearest tree by the British. The next day, August 15th, Washington showed the French fleet commander's letter to Rochambeau. Didn't matter, though. Washington had already made his decision. He ordered Rochambeau to prepare his troops to march south to Virginia. Well, the very next day, August 16th, Washington finally got a little bit of good news. He learned that Cornwallis had dug in at Yorktown, Virginia, on the water. That meant the French Navy could close the siege ring while Washington and Rochambeau's troops attacked on land. Washington told Rochambeau to proceed through New Jersey along an inland route so the British in New York City wouldn't know their whereabouts. At this point, suffice it to say, Washington's decision worked out quite well. Cornwallis was beaten, and the British decided at that point to call it quits. They gave the Patriots their country and headed back to England. After all, England still had Canada. The next part of this story concerns the effort that's underway to preserve the tremendous history of this trail for the future. And for that, we turn to Johnny Carowan. He's the trail administrator for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historical Trail. Well, that's a mouthful, but it basically means he's in charge of the Rochambeau Trail for the National Park Service. The Rochambeau Trail, as a formal concept, was only approved in 2009 by Congress during Barack Obama's administration. And for now, Johnny is a one-man show, but he has big plans and a great vision and is working very hard to pull many strings together to make the trail more widely known. To begin with, Johnny has a summary statement about this trail. The Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail is a story about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And he knows that despite the incredible history, it's a story that's not yet well known. There's a significance to this trail that um, we're finding that it, that people are still learning about it today. Johnny says the trail is loaded with opportunities for teachable moments. What makes it really exciting is this trail really tells a lot of the lesser known stories of the American Revolution. For example, one of Johnny's main objectives is to dispel a commonly held misconception about who actually won America's independence for her. You know, my thought of the American Revolution was uh, was the white male, uh, you know, the, the Mel Gibson in the movie Patriot. That was kind of the, the aspect that I thought when I thought of the American Revolution. And he plans to take that ball and run with it to tell the true story of the diversity involved with the drive for American independence. There's a lot of opportunities for people to learn in greater detail the involvement of women and children, Native Americans, African Americans, all who contributed to to our nation's uh, freedom. The Rochambeau Trail won't be the same as, say, the Appalachian Trail, a 2,200-mile-long dedicated hiking path from Georgia to Maine. Instead, there's going to be an effort to secure and preserve a number of places along the trail. Now, in eastern Connecticut, where there's been less development over the years, many of the sites remain pretty close to their original states. But once you get closer to New York in Fairfield, Litchfield, and New Haven counties, a number of the sites have already been permanently disturbed. Still, there are endless opportunities to use online technology to help pinpoint locations on maps. In fact, Dr. Bob Selig is the author of all of the site descriptions that you'll find on the main website for this trail. In fact, you should bookmark this site. It's w3r-us.org. Again, that's w3r-us.org. And that stands for Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, W3R. Some sites already have the W3R plaques installed, and more are coming. Johnny says he realizes he can't do it all alone. 
Another part of his plan is to staff up his crew in 2023 with interpretive park rangers at select locations to help people understand this remarkable part of our history. I call them the school teachers to the park. They help to interpret the value and meaning of objects and places to people. One of Johnny Carawan's brilliant marketing ideas was to offer a $10,000 grant for ideas and proposals on how to promote the trail. We'll enter Sal Lilienthal. Sal's a resident of Kent, Connecticut, and there he runs his business, The Bicycle Tour Company. And on the side, he's written two books on the Revolutionary War. There was Revolutionary Connecticut, published in 2012, and Revolutionary Battles, Experience America's Roads to Independence, published in 2014. Well, we'll end the suspense. Sal won that grant. But you don't know yet about the incredible proposal he put forth that won it, or the unbelievable difficulties he had to face in implementing it. Sal proposed to bicycle and kayak the entire 680-mile length of the Rochambeau Trail. He'd bring along some bike riders with him, and he'd stop along the way for special events. A home-run idea. Well, Sal based his idea on what he's observed over the years with his bike touring company, something he calls experience learning. In one such case, he took students on a ride to Ridgefield. That's where there was a major skirmish between British and Patriot forces back in 1777, after the British had burned Danbury and were heading back to their ships off the coast of Westport. When you go to the spot where you know Benedict Arnold was pinned down by his horse, and there was a blockade on Main Street in Ridgefield, or the spot where General Worcester was mortally wounded, you know you could see a light go off in the kids' heads. You know this is wait what happened here. And then they go back and, and research it, or this is where uh, the British fired a cannonball in Tequila Tavern, and you could actually see the cannonball. It's still there from a couple hundred years ago. He says he likes to cast such historical events in sports terms. Students often relate to such terminology and come away with a greater appreciation for the events. Regarding the final siege of Yorktown, he tells his writers that it's like the Super Bowl of the war. Or the seventh game in the World Series and it's extra innings, and this is the team that scored the winning run. Sal says he considers himself fortunate to live in Connecticut. To me, we're right in the middle of the American Revolution here. I mean, you could travel by car eight hours in each direction, and you could cover two-thirds of the American Revolution. Having won the grant, Sal then had to plan out exactly how to pull it off. Only COVID got in the way, and the 2020 version had to be postponed. Then in 2021, with the virus still a problem, substantial adjustments had to be made. Sal says the Park Service wasn't entirely comfortable with some of the very narrow, treacherous roads that bicyclists would need to navigate. Plus, COVID argued against too many public activities, so they said he should go it alone. Sal got his bike, his chase van, and a small support crew out to Newport, Rhode Island, where the Rochambeau Trail begins. The first stage actually required Sal to be in his kayak in the water that Rochambeau's troops had to cross to get from Newport to the Rhode Island mainland. On Narragansett Bay, most of the time, it's at least three, four, five, six feet of chop. And then and on the ocean side, it's even more. So I wasn't used to that, but once I started practicing that, I really enjoyed it. Sal had agreed with the Park Service to hold at least one marquee event in each state. Connecticut's event was held in Waterbury. There are two French soldiers buried um, at East Farm Cemetery in Waterbury. So we had a cemetery, uh, ceremony there with three enactors at, at their gravesite. It was right after that event that a spell of bad luck befell Sal and his plans. He was supposed to ride his bike from that Waterbury Cemetery to the Odell House, Rochambeau's headquarters in Greenberg, where another event was scheduled. Unfortunately for Sal and his crew, the follow-up van with his kayak, spare bicycle, multiple spare parts, and spare clothes broke down while passing through Newtown. I called my dad and says, can you go rent a U-Haul so we could take all the stuff from the van, put in the U-Haul. Jeff and my dad put everything from the van into the U-Haul while I continued biking. The Odell house was still 50 miles away, but he made it on time. An important part of this promotional undertaking was to highlight Johnny Carowan's vision of educating the public about the diversity that existed during the American Revolution. One great example is the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. 
it was almost entirely comprised of African-American soldiers. Sal says that during the war, the regiment had been assigned to protect a crossing on the Croton River in Yorktown, New York. There was a skirmish. It's called the Battle of Pines Bridge. Um, and there's a monument to the 1st Red Island Regiment um, at Yorktown Heights, New York. So we had a ceremony there. From there, Sal was to face yet another test. In fact, a much more daunting challenge. In Delaware, he staged an event with some children on their bicycles near Wilmington before settling down for the evening. We stay overnight in Delaware at a hotel, and the next morning the van was stolen. Everything. My bikes, my kayak, um, all my spare parts, everything. So I bought that bike right there, the cheapest bike in the store. We rented a car and kept on going. Sal realized he had to simply keep his focus. And as unbelievable as these events were, he was on a mission. No one's allowed to mention the truck. No one's allowed to talk about insurance. It was just like, no one's talking about this. And all we're focusing on is the ride that day. Fortunately, he had a cousin who lived in the vicinity who owned a boat and a kayak. Sal was able to do a ceremonial paddling in the Chesapeake Bay in his cousin's kayak. And yet a potential mishap of even more significance was just narrowly avoided, a threat that came from Mother Nature herself. Despite all the stuff that happened with the van and the stuff getting stolen and the truck and all that, we got unbelievably lucky with the weather. We did get some rain, and the day the tornado was supposed to hit Wilmington, um, we didn't get a drop of rain. So all's well that ends well. Sal's amazing bike and kayak trip took two weeks in August of 2021, and he has tons of pictures and memories to show for it. Well, except that's not the end of Sal's story. This was kind of a warm-up ride for the 250th anniversary. The semi-quincentennial, or 250th birthday, of the United States is just around the corner in 2026. And Sal already has his date set up for the next bike trip. We want more people involved. We want the events to be bigger. We want to bring people from Europe over, especially France, to be biking and kayaking with us. Sal figures that the actual year of the country's 250th birthday, 2026, will be overrun with competing activities. So he's targeting 2025. He plans to start at Newport in June of that year and ride up to the Victory Monument in Yorktown, Virginia on the 4th of July, 2025. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. I want to thank my guest for this episode, Johnny Carawan, the trail administrator for the National Park Service for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historical Trail. Sal Lilienthal, the Kent, Connecticut resident who actually biked and kayaked the length of the trail to help promote it. And Dr. Bob Seelig, the foremost expert on the Rochambeau March and the Revolutionary War. Please follow me at my main podcast website, amazingtalesct.podbean.com. Also, in between episodes, you can check out my Facebook page at Amazing Tales CT. That's where I place photos supplementing my podcasts. Plus, I'd love to hear from you, and you can always send me an idea for a story you'd like me to look into. Well, if you liked what you heard, spread the word with your family and friends. See you next time here on Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's Beaten Path. I'm Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. Music